Okay. Well, Pierce Morgan versus Ben Jablino on Israel Hamas war. Okay. Well, good evening, London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Five days ago, terrorists from Hamas attacked Israel. They murdered and raped civilians. They executed the elderly at bus stops. They took babies and Holocaust survivors as hostages, and they massacred young people at a festival. They may, it emerged last night, have even beheaded babies in one village. More than 1,200 Israelis are now believed to have died, and this brutal attack has dragged Israel into war. Israel had every right to respond with force, as it's done. The death toll in Gaza is now more than 1,000, and many more will die. Many of those will be completely innocent people, like those who died in the Hamas attacks. Like almost everyone, I've been shocked and sickened by the stories and videos emerging from the attack. I've also been stunned by the moral cowardice of those who celebrated terror as resistance and brutality Ooh, as politics. Whoa. I've called out the Hassan people who completed the out. terror attack with a geopolitical debate, and I've spoken to fair-minded people on both sides of that debate. I've done all this as a journalist and a human being, but with no personal skin in the game. My guest tonight, on the other hand, is one of the most prominent and influential Jewish commentators on the planet. Ben Shapiro has been visibly moved. I guess he doesn't really have to appear impartial or whatever because it's Pierce Morgan. But the fact that it was like Israel has every right to respond with force and then just like... I feel it'd be worth mentioning that the rest of the world seems to be quite concerned about how much force Israel is using. But yeah, okay. And enraged by the tragedies unfolding in Israel, and the world has paid attention to his analysis. And tonight I'm giving the show to him as we tackle all the big questions that have come out of this. What is a proportionate response to terrorism? Oh, OK. Should wow. the United States be more involved? Oh. How do we move forward if everyone involved sees the other side as an oppressor or a savage? And the Daily Wire's Ben Shapiro joins me now. Ben, uh, great to have you on the programme. I wish it was under different circumstances. I want to ask you, first of all, where were you when you first heard about these attacks? So I'd been in Israel for several weeks, and we had just gotten home to uh, to the United States on Friday morning. Uh, Friday night, obviously, is Sabbath for, for Orthodox Jews, uh, and it, it also happened to be one of the biggest celebratory days. How can his mic sound so shit? Who's in charge of that? It sounds like a cheap headset mic that gamers use. He's got the fucking... Is that a U87? If it is, this mic would be worth like a couple of thousand, but I don't know why it's like a, it's a condenser that's far away, but he's also got a lapel mic on. So, is this a U87? I actually can't tell. It might not be. Oh well. Of the year, Shemini Atzeret Simcha Taurus was a, a two-day, what we call Yom Tov, which means no electricity, really, you can't use your phone, you can't use your computer. Uh, my security team showed up at synagogue on Saturday morning uh, and started informing me of what had happened, and then news was was oh. kind of bleeding through throughout the day. Uh, there were various sources, you know, maids who were leaving TVs on, for example, or uh, my security team informing me throughout the weekend of what exactly was happening because of the serious security concerns that arise for Jews all over the planet when there's mass terror attack uh, in Israel or or anywhere else. And um, and so you know, we were finding out in uh, a lagged time what exactly was happening. Obviously, we couldn't watch the videos, we couldn't see exactly what was happening until. It came back online on Sunday night and were hit with the news that at that point, 700 Jews have been murdered today. That number is uh, has been totaled that well over 1,200 Jews have been murdered uh, in, in Israel. We started to see all of the pictures on our TVs. Uh, I obviously, because I'm in touch with, with a lot of people on the ground, first responders, uh, people on the ground in Israel, I started receiving extraordinary levels of, of footage and, and video and audio and, and pictures of what exactly had happened in these places. And... Um, yeah, I mean, these are these are images. I've, I've been trying to show them to the audience for, for one very specific reason. Uh, and that specific reason is to, to, to understand what evil is, you have to look in the face of evil. And I, I think that so brave. You know, we in the West yeah. have a, a peculiar narcissism that we, everyone thinks like we do, uh, that that we value children in a certain way. And so everyone values children in a certain way. Uh, that, that if somebody does something truly terrible or evil, it must be that there was something that quote unquote drove them to, it must be a policy question. Um, but as it turns out, that that is not the case because there's literally nothing I think there is that could drive people in in the West, a normal person, uh, to go and to murder a baby in their crib uh, in in a civilian area, to to simply walk in and gun down 
grandmothers or to rape a woman and drag her back to the Gaza Strip. What, what could drive you to do that? I can't think of anything that would drive me to do that. But there are a lot of people who are not only driven to do that, but but believe full well in the virtue of, of what they're doing. That is a different mode of thought. And that I mean, is not does this guy not know exactly? I guess just, he's saying like, I can't believe any, I can't imagine any Western ever being driven to do that. I mean, it's like we, like, Amer- like even recently, America committed atrocities in Iraq, like in those fucking, what was that jail called? With the fucking people on the leashes and the electrocutions and shit like that. Or even just like the stuff that, um, that all these countries were kind of founded on as well. Even World War II was full of like massive atrocities during the Abu Ghraib. Yeah, yeah. Um, Abu Ghraib? 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 Yeah, whatever. Um, I always feel like when right-wingers talk like this, you know when you hear people say, I think we really can't look at this issue through a Western lens. Uh, it's very naive, in fact, to look at this issue through the white, white Western lens. And you're like, oh, is this person actually going to say something like kind of profound? And then it's always, if it's the Middle East, it's always followed up with... Uh, it's always followed up with them actually just saying, because, you know, these brown people are fucking crazy, okay? These fucking Muslims, they are absolutely batshit fucking insane, okay? Like, that, it's always followed up by this, like, really crude... And the question you always ask is, like, why are they like that, okay? If, if that's what they're doing, if that's what you think they're like, more so than people in fucking America, uh, why? Because I feel like someone like Ben Shapiro is either going to is going to be driven down the path of the fact that he ultimately thinks it's in their nature, right? Like it's something like their DNA is different. Um, eek. you can negotiate with. You've seemed about this for completely understandable reasons to have been more enraged than I think I've ever seen you, almost like a simmering volcano as you've talked about this. I want to play a clip from your Daily Wire YouTube channel. You have six million subscribers. And this is part of what was, I thought, a very powerful address that you made there. I am a Jew. Those have been the words of the Jewish people for three millennia. Those were the words of the men, women, and children of Masada. Those were the words of the followers of Bar Kokhba. Those were the words of Jews in Granada in 1066 and the Rhineland in 1096 and Khamenevsky from 1648 to 1657, and Kishinev in 1903, and Hevron in 1929. Those were the words of Jews in Auschwitz and Treblinka. Those were the last words of Daniel Pearl. And those are my words too. They're the words of my parents, the words of my wife, my children. Over the weekend, my people, the Jewish people, were attacked. They were murdered, mutilated, our women were raped, our children were kidnapped. This has happened millions of times before to millions of Jews across history. Jew hatred exists because evil exists, because there are people who have, for literally all of human history, hated the Jews and sought to strike at them while they are weak, who have blamed the Jews for their own problems, who have crafted complex conspiracy theories about the supposed I'm sorry, power- it's just like... I, don't, I just wonder, like, again, Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people. They don't even represent Gazans, really. Like, they're not, very, they're not as popular as people like Ben probably think they are. It's just like, the problem is, like, Ben's not a dumb person. But he is, like, he applies all his intelligence to being a propagandist. And that's kind of why I fucking hate him. Like, that's why I get so triggered by him, because he's... Because you can tell he's clever because he's good at it. He's really good at propagandizing. Like, because the response I have to give now is to say, is it not kind of a coincidence that it came from, that this attack came from the part of the world where um, Israel is like blockading, suffocating, controlling the airspace, controlling the borders, refusing peace negotiations for over like for, for over two decades? And then where like more than half of the kids grew up with fucking PTSD because of all the bombs going off. And I'm just like, oh, but then I'm blaming them for their problems. That's what he would say, because he's a master. It's just such a weak level. It's such a weak way of looking at it. Like, oh, because there's evil in the world. Like, yeah, shit. Okay. Power of the Jews who have sought to destroy, to murder, to mutilate, to rape the Jews from Pharaoh to Haman, from Hitler to Hamas. Mm. What reaction have you had to that, Ben? I think the reaction has been pretty strong and, and 
overwhelmingly positive. I, I think there are, there are a lot of people, not only Jews, mostly my audience is people who are not Jewish, obviously, who, who understand the history uh, of the Jewish people, who understand what it means when, when the greatest slaughter of Jews on a mass scale happens since the Holocaust, and, and who understand that it is inextricably linked to a history of anti-Semitism that goes back thousands of years. I mean, this extermination level anti-Semitism, what you see from Hamas, it's literally part of their charter. Uh, and so the attempt to, to treat them as a normal political yeah. body obviously is foolish. I, I think that a lot of people resonated to that. It's the, certainly the strongest I felt about any, anything that mm. happened in my lifetime since 9-11 um, as an American, uh, since 9-11. And uh, as a Jew, obviously, I, I'm, I'm watching as people that I know, people I'm friends with, are, are getting called up to go to the military and serve in Gaza, try to protect uh, the, the Israeli citizenry who are Jews and Arabs, who are Christians and Jews and Muslims. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I'm watching as... You know, there there are people out there who are rallying on behalf of of actual terrorist groups murdering children. I mean, it's it's an amazing. Like, yeah, it's just, it's so in, intellectually, it's just fucking boring. I get why it works because conservatives like they don't have brains. You know, they just listen to it and they're like, yeah, yeah, whoa. Especially American conservatives, yeah, whoa, anti-Semitism, oh, the evil. There's so much evil in the world. Br brown people, yeah, they're because they're brown, yeah. But the, the fact is, is that intellect, like Ben Shapiro is probably one of the biggest fucking liars about Israel Palestine. And he probably knows that most Americans don't know anything about it. So they can just, I think he believes, like he, he even goes back to, like, he thinks that um, there's evidence of like Jews originating around like Egypt and North Africa, which again is like, like originally, like at the very beginning. And I think the only sort like historical source for the claim that he gave about the origin of the Jews in North Africa is in the Bible, right? So he starts with that. Um, he is a... He's a Nakba denier. He thinks the reason it's called the Nakba is because Arabs started. A, is because uh, Arabs were pissed off that Israel had a state. He thinks they call it the Nakba because they were upset that Israel has a state. May 14th, 1948, the British mandate officially ends. Israel declares its independence. Right? This is Yom Ha'atzma'ut, or as the Arabs like to call it, the Nakba. Right? They call it a disaster that Israel was established. Loner, add me to approved redirect so I can raid you. Yes, ma'am. Hang on, how do I do? I thought I had you followed. Wait, hang on. Let me see. Exactly the same. Uh. Oh, I'm subscribed. Okay, I'll, okay, I know how to do it. I got you, I got you. Oh, this is intense because I have to figure out how to fucking do it now. All right, hang on. Community. Oh, here we are. Keffels. Oh, it's Keffels Live. That's why I need to, okay. Caffles live. Okay, I've added it. It might not update, so otherwise you can just do it organically, but eh, cool. All right. What was I fucking saying? Oh, yeah, he's a fucking, yeah, he's a Nakba denier. He's one of the ones that pushes the idea that Gaza, the withdrawal, was a, was a good faith effort to start peace. He's the one that believes that Israel just walked out and just disengaged completely, like Israel had nothing to do with Gaza anymore, like just ignoring the fact that they still controlled the border, the airspace, the maritime space, the population registry, the control of movement of people and goods in and out. He just ignores all of that. Um, he, he spreads the big fucking lie about Palestinians never being open to recognizing an Israeli state, even though since 1988, uh, the PLO has recognized an Israeli state. He advocated for pop, for, uh, Ethnic, yeah, yeah, he's done that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because he is part of the Likud wing. His entire goal is to either maintain a Palestinian limbo uh, whilst expanding settlements into everywhere that they feel like it and just hoping that the permanent state of limbo in Gaza and the West Bank just kind of stays there, right? Or that eventually the people all leave. The reason everyone in Gaza is so scared right now about leaving from the north to the south, the reason that fucks everyone off so much is because they know that the way Israel operates and the way that the Israeli right wing operates, they know that if Israel ever has the chance to get them, leave, to, get them to leave, that they won't be allowed back. Hamas are not wrong when they say that. Like, because it's the logical conclusion of what the Israeli right wants. They don't want a Palestinian state. They've said they don't want a Palestinian state for a really long time. Keffel's viewers, hello, welcome to the stream. Oh, where'd you guys come from? Out of nowhere. It's an amazing, I would say, exposure of, of 
ignorance at, at, at best, ignorance at best and Jew hatred at worst. Do you have any personal connection to anyone who's, <laughs> whose life was taken? Oh, I'm sorry. It's just because of... Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. Uh, I would say that I, I have, um, certainly, I know a lot of people who do. So mm -hmm. the, the way to, to talk about the Jewish community in general, there are not very many Jews on the planet. Uh, due to conspiracy theories, people tend to think there are tens of millions of Jews on like, the planet. Can you imagine if I applied this analysis to Israelis? If someone asked me, like, hey, Lonerbox, why do you think uh, Israelis keep on voting for these like right-wing expansionist governments that don't want peace, that just want to keep on pushing the West Bank like further and further uh, away and just choking off Gaza and using whatever opportunity they can to get people out of there. Well, I, I imagine if my answer to that was, oh, you know, these, uh, these Israelis, they're just like, they're just very colonial, you know, uh, ignorance, evil, colonial, you know, it's just, it's just, they, they just like it, you know, they just got the colonial gene. Imagine if I spoke like that. The fuck? Like, cause I can explain why Israelis vote right wing. Like, it's not because, like, they used to vote quite left-wing. They used to vote for peace processes to some degree. Um, the reason they stopped was because those peace processes failed. And after they failed, there was a lot of violence, like the Second Intifada. And it's this very small country. So over time, you get to a position where more and more Israelis know people who died. And then they just, like, when you know someone who died, you don't really, you, it becomes more and more easy for the right wing to sell you this image that Jews everyone hates you. Everyone has always hated you. These guys, Palestinians especially hate you. Uh, the moment you give them any self-determination or, or any weapons or any fucking uh, space to breathe, they will just use that breathing space to amass arms and kill you, right? So, the, and, and if you know more people, and as more terror attacks happen and more violence happens, uh, and with the, all of this surrounding Arab countries doing similar things at different times, uh, it's easy for them to sell that to you. Yeah, people are emotional. It's, it's what happens. Um, so, I don't know. But I guess if I was on the daily left wing wire, maybe I wouldn't talk about that. I would just be like, no, they're just colonial, you know, just the Israeli colonial fucking juju. Planet, the, the grand total number of Jews on planet Earth is about 15 million, about 7 million who live in the state of Israel, there are about 6 million who live in the United States. And what that means is that in general society, you think, you know, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, you, with, with seven degrees of, of connection, you can find anyone. Uh, in uh, among among Jews, that that's one. That number is one. So I, I certainly know an, an enormous number of people who uh, who have had people who are kidnapped, who have had people who are murdered. I certainly know personally an enormous number of people who are on the ground right now. Uh, I know Americans who are who are in Israel with me who decided to stay over the last day of the Yom Tov over the over the holiday uh, and ended up basically getting stuck there because the the airport was shut down because of rocket attacks. And uh, and when the call went out to everybody with medical training to to show up to to help. I know American doctors who showed up at the Gaza border to simply set up triage stations and help people out. So, I mean, it is, it's a very small community. It's a very close-knit community, obviously. You've spoken a lot about Hamas before, uh, called them evil. Uh, you did a second video called Make God Avenge Their Blood, in which you said that Hamas, in some ways, they are worse than Nazis, which some viewed as a very provocative statement. Why did you say that about them? Is he going to say that because Hamas broadcasted their attacks whereas the nazis tried to hide them which again isn't entirely true like the nazis didn't really hide kristallnacht they encouraged it right um but okay they did try to hide the gas chambers though that's true because after um action t4 it turned out the germans weren't actually all that keen on mass murder of people but you know I think also there's one really grim fact about the Nazis was like the reason that they, because the original plan for the Holocaust was the death squads, the Einsatz group, after they ditched all the deportation shit, it was the death squads um, to just go into towns, round them up and kill them all and pile up the bodies. And they were killing like tens of thousands of people in one go. And the reason they stopped that was one, bullets were expensive. Like it was expensive compared to gassing less efficient but also the, the other reason they did it was because it traumatized the soldiers soldiers just they were refusing to do it and then that was why they moved it to this much more like clinical like impersonal uh industrial kind of like line production sort of like production line uh approach that's why like it would be like they put the fucking what do you call it Zyklon through like a hole, through like a, like a hole in the ceiling, so that they, could, they couldn't see what was happening. Yeah. And then there was only like a very small number of like sociopaths who would take the jobs to like do all the dirty work. Yeah.
Yeah. The, the Nazis, I mean, uh, here's a phrase I'll, I'll never use again, at least the Nazis. So uh, at, at least the Nazis uh, attempted to hide their crimes. Uh, so, so the Nazis obviously recognized <laughs> death. Watch. They had Einsatzgruppen uh, units that, that drove up to, to Jewish villages and would mow people down. Um, and then they would bury them, and then they would try to hide the crimes. And it took you know, the Nuremberg team years to, to undig all of that material. In this particular case, you have Hamas terrorists who are murdering Jews in their beds and then live streaming it and, and celebrating it and bragging about it and, and talking about how incredible it is and blasting that sort of stuff out. I mean, the videos that I've been showing on my show, a lot of them are coming directly from Hamas. I mean, it's Hamas that, that is taking contemporaneous video of this sort of stuff. And that, that's a whole new level of evil I mean, that, that, to, to celebrate evil. this sort of stuff, to treat it as a triumph. I mean, th I think the thing that, that, that people really have to realize here is this is not a military operation. Mm. This was not a military operation. I mean, people have compared this to, for example, the 1973 Yom Kippur War. That was an awful moment in Israel's history when it was taken by surprise by the combined Arab armies around it. But that was a military operation with a military objective, which was to seize territory. This is not a military operation with a military objective. This was this is an operation directed specifically at civilians. And, and when we see death in Gaza, which we're going to see and the images are going to be horrifying and terrible. It is important to understand that the reason that that is happening. I don't know if that's completely true, because I think some of the uh, unf unfortunately, it seems like one of the things that happened. I only saw one article saying this, so don't quote me on it. But I think it's made sense from the, some of the video footage was that. It seems to be the case that Hamas didn't expect to hold on to land because Palestinian militants have never been able to do that. Um, but I like to hold on to territory or villages. I don't think they expected that. I think they expected that they would just kill some people, grab some hostages, and then embarrass the IDF and get some prisoner swaps. Um, but I think once they, uh, they had bulldozed the fucking wall, loads of like people just like... A lot of, uh, a lot of the people were also just like random people. Like... I guess like random sympathizers who went over and started like fucking shit up as well. So, yeah. Um, but I guess he's like kind of right that it's not like Yom Kippur because it was much, it's like their goals are just a lot more uh, opaque. But yeah. It's not just because Hamas crossed the border and murdered a bunch of civilians in their beds, but also because Hamas literally hides its weaponry behind civilians. Israel yeah. is currently right now sending out messages to Gazan civilians telling them to get out of particular areas. And Hamas is sending out full scale messages telling people to ignore those messages and to stay where they are. Now, Hamas is is they, they, there's a reason why their headquarters were for years located underneath a hospital. I mean, it's the, the, the what, what they what they, they understand that the West, again, has a peculiar narcissism where we think we would never put our military our military hardware below a hospital, that'd be insane. Um, and so if Israel blows up a hospital, it must be that Israel's doing that because they're targeting civilians. Hamas knows that. That's that's why they're doing it. That's why they're doing it. They literally hide their rocket launchers behind apartment buildings in the hope that Israel will strike back and have to kill civilians in the process. Israel cares significantly more about civilian casualties in Gaza than Hamas ever has. One of the, I mean, there have been so Is he many really going to say that now? I mean, he will because he's Ben Shapiro. But after, it's been confirmed, by the way, by uh, at least by if you go by Amnesty International, it's been confirmed that Israel have been using white phosphorus. And the last time they used that, although, again, white phosphorus is technically not illegal, um, it is generally seen as a pretty reckless thing to do in civilian, in dense civilian areas. So it's most likely that they've already broken uh, laws with their use of white phosphorus. And also... I just think listening to the, all these IDF statements, like they all look rattled in their interviews. They all just look fucking wired. And all these statements from like the Israeli president saying that there's no distinction between uh, Palestine, like Gazans and Hamas, because the because the Gazans could have rose up, even though when Gazans do rise up against Hamas, they get fucking abducted and tortured and the shit beaten out of them and often killed. But I mean. It's like it's quite. I'd be so surprised if, like, yeah, they, they've clearly committed war, like committed war crimes. I'm pretty confident saying that now. Like, yeah, but fuck. Any horrendous uh, images and videos? The, the poor girl from the music festival taken away on the motorbike was just uh, bone chilling to watch. Um, I, I saw something on CNN yesterday with Jake Tapper where he's interviewing the relative of uh, a grandmother, his grandmother, who was murdered and. Hamas posted the video of her being murdered onto her Facebook page so mm -hmm. her family would watch it. I mean, when you hear that, it's sort of unconscionable. It's, it's kind of beyond depravity. This is inhumanity.
I mean, Piers, you, you're in the business of words and I'm in the business of words and I've- How is white phosphorus not technically illegal? So I've only read a bit about this today, but it's not, it's just not illegal. Like you can use it on military targets. And I think it's just in context. So usually the way it works is with, it's with proportionality uh, in terms of civilian life and military gain. That's why, um, despite the massive aggression of the IDF and the fact that they're like 100 plus percent going way over the top um the way that hamas operates it does make it like very like basically impossible to hit hamas targets without uh hitting civilians like generally but um white phosphorus apparently has legitimate uses although when israel used it in 2008 um they did say that it was like reckless because it's a it's like an insanely dense civilian area i don't think there's any way you can use white phosphorus in a responsible way in somewhere like gaza Because it literally sprays out like rain, you know, like, um, that's my understanding of it anyway. I'm not like a fucking war crime expert, but that's what I read about it, uh, just today. Found myself repeatedly over the last few days. People keep saying it's legal as a smoke screen for signaling, but not legal in populated areas. But I think the thing I saw was that it could be well, in populated areas, I guess. I think they said it could be legal in civilian areas, but it would have to be like, but it's just very unlikely there would ever be a case where it is. I think that's what I got from the Goldstone fucking person, but yeah. Unable to, to find words to describe the kind of thing that we're seeing. And again, we, we stretch, I think, in the West, and I huh. stretch as an American, We I think we all stretch to try and find, you know, w what would drive somebody to do something like this? And the answer sometimes is that they are just- Evil. They're, I don't know how to say this otherwise. They are not like you. Hamas is not like you. They don't think like you. They don't have the same priorities as you. They don't wow. have the same values as you. And that means that any attempt to buy them off is, is bound to fail. And, and this is inextricably intertwined with the history. I mean, the fact is Israel turned over the Gaza Strip in 2005. There were no Jews living in the Gaza Strip since 2005. The areas that were attacked in this particular terrorist attack are not areas that are in the so-called settlements, the Shtachim in Judea, Samaria, what's called the West Bank. That, that, that's not the area that was attacked. The area that was attacked has been sovereign Israeli territory since 1947-48. Yeah, and they turned it over after five years of Sharon rejecting peace agreements and rejecting talks with the PA, with Feta, so that when it came to 2005 and Israel unilaterally pulled out, guess who took credit for it? Not the negotiators. Hamas took credit. Because, th because they could. Because they said, look, our violence achieved what negotiations couldn't. They basically handed that fucking PR win on a plate. Eight. And, and that territory was attacked from across a border that is entirely controlled by Hamas, which has utilized pretty much every dollar that has, that has flooded into that. <laughs> what? Wait, wait, wait. I didn't. Did I mishear that? Region over the course by Hamas. And, and that territory was attacked from across a border that is entirely controlled by Hamas, which has utilized- He's just fucking dumb. He's just a, he's a fucking moron. Which border crossing does Hamas control? <laughs> I know the answer. Six of them are controlled by um, Israel, by the IDF, and one is controlled by Rafa, by uh, Egypt, the Rafa crossing. Jesus. Because his, his idea is that, like, the right-wing position on the uh, Gaza disengagement is that Israel gave it to the Palestinians. And it's like, it's full, it's like it was their full responsibility. Which means they just hope you don't know about the border crossings or the, uh, the airspace or the maritime border. It's pretty much every dollar that has, that has flooded into that region over the course of 20 years from America, from Europe, taxpayer dollars that have been used to build up these terror capabilities. And every time there are cement shipments into, into the, the area ruled by Hamas, Hamas has used it to build terror tunnels. Pipes that have been sent into the area ruled by Hamas that were meant to build sewage systems have been repurposed and used for, for rocket tubes. I mean, this is, this is in, it, it's, it's utterly insane. And to, to try and come up with some sort of territorial solution, this is really just a territorial dispute. It is not a territorial, territorial dispute. It is, it is a genocidal group that makes clear its own intentions. I don't know how many times people have to tell you who they are before we believe them. The reason that I've been saying that Hamas is genocidal for literally my entire career is because they say in their own founding documents that right. they are genocidal. It's, 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 it's not as though they're attempting to 
avoid culpability or responsibility for this. They are saying it out loud. They're begging you to take them seriously. Well, they're, also, and they're, then, they're also terrorists. I mean, let's just be crystal clear. This is <laughs> an act of terrorism that we saw at the weekend. Pierce is so stupid. He can, he's so bad at thinking on his feet. I've noticed this. They're genocidal. Aha, they're also terrorists. Bro, genocidal is like probably a bit worse than... I don't know why. <laughs> These guys are genocidal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they also kill people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what the fuck? These guys are genocidal. Yeah. They're also, uh, they're also, they're also like right wing. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. Again, the worst well, since 9-11, one of the worst terror attacks. Uh, Stephen O with the two euros, would you call current actions by Israel a genocide? Uh, no. I don't think we know enough about, exactly about their intentions just yet. Uh, not, by, not by the UN definition, like definitely not. Um, if the people in North Gaza don't get a right to return, it will be an ethnic cleansing. That's what will have happened. Um, yeah. In modern <laughs> history, and yet you have mainstream media, the BBC in Britain, refusing to describe Hamas as terrorists. They call them militants. Even John Simpson, one of their senior foreign correspondents and editors, said it's not a journalist's role to call <laughs> groups like Hamas terrorists. He says calling someone a terrorist means you're taking sides and ceasing to treat the situation with due impartiality. The BBC's job is to place the facts before its audience and let them decide what they think, honestly and without ranting. That's why in Britain and throughout the world, nearly half a billion watch, listen to and read us. There's always someone who'd like us to rant. Sorry, it's not what we do, but I don't think it's about ranting to describe acts of terror as being committed by terrorists. And the New York Times apparently today actually... What's the difference? Um, very quickly, and I'm just going by international definitions. I'm not like, okay, because that's, I like to go by what's established. Um, the difference is, is that, um, genocide is that you're doing it with a very special calculated premeditated attempt to kill members of a particular group. Um, so there's a difference between if Israel was doing what they're doing just because they want to kill as many Palestinians as possible versus, um, if they are killing uh, civilians incidentally uh, and not caring that much about collateral damage because they want to take out Hamas. That's the difference. Intentionality like really matters when it comes to genocide. That's why, um, yeah, yeah, that's like if you're going to read the, if you're going to go by like the actual definition, that's why it would be different. Changed uh, the wording of a story they, they put online and changed the word Hamas terrorists to Hamas gunmen, as if they're almost terrified, you know, literally, I mean, how ironic, of using the word terrorist. But what is it about mainstream media, two huge examples of it, New York Times and the BBC, that they won't just call this what it is? I think that, that a lot of these groups are afraid of the political implications of, of just calling a terrorist a terrorist. I mean, when, when you acknowledge that the government of, of the Gaza Strip is in fact a terrorist government, that has some pretty large scale implications for a lot of the political. What did I say? Every time like partisans complain about mainstream media, it's 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 usually an, it's an indication of like either thing. It could be one that they're just so partisan that anything that doesn't work in their favor is like seen as biased. But also just people who complain about mainstream media, like oh they never talk about this. They never. I can't believe they, it's because they don't watch mainstream media. Like I think the BBC and the other mainstream media groups are, are okay to call Hamas militants because their job is not to be like moral their job is not to be fucking like uh their job is to at least appear impartial right mm -hmm. and they've made a few mistakes with that with all the, the uh was it like a thousand israelis killed uh two thousand gazans dead right that's that they fuck up with that a lot but like when it came to hamas calling them a militant organization is fair because they're not just a like they're not a terror group in the same way that Al Qaeda are, right? Where that's like their goal. They're also um, they also are in charge of infrastructure. Like they're in charge of um, they have level, different levels of control of providing uh, welfare and provisions, and they collect taxes and shit like that. So that's why they're more like they're a militant group rather than like just terrorists, right? It's it's probably fair for the media to do that. It's ironic that you see like Ben Shapiro or people like Hassan making the exact same complaints about the mainstream media. It's like they're not telling the story the way I want them to. <laughs> okay. Agenda is at play because, of course, the, the great 
sort of dream of, of the West since at least the Oslo Accords has been that territorial concessions and, and that economic concessions would, would solve this problem. And when it turns out that an entire area is governed by a, a government that is in fact a terrorist government, is an actual terrorist group, uh, then that has some pretty significant implications moving forward. Oh, by the way, th when he says that, um, he also means the PLO. So he mentioned the Oslo Accords and then said this can't be a thing because Gaza is governed by a terror group. Well, those are 10 years, those are 12 years apart. Oslo Accords were 93, Gaza was 2005. When he's saying that the Oslo Accords can't work because the Palestinians are run by terrorists, he also means Fatah. He doesn't just mean Hamas. He thinks that the he, he thinks like um he thinks Abbas is a terrorist. Like yeah. Uh, for the prospects in the region. And it also suggests that Israel has a moral duty, which it absolutely does, to protect its own citizenry by eviscerating that terrorist group from the planet. And the word terrorist has a definition. And that definition, by any stretch of the imagination, is fulfilled by, by what Hamas is. I mean, the, the BBC's explanation is so bizarre. It's almost like suggesting that if you found a, a man who had murdered his wife in an apartment and you reported on that, you didn't call it murder. You just said that some, someone was killed. A person mm. was killed and, and and the person was convicted of murder. And you still said they're not a murder. We, we, we don't make judgments over here and use language like the word murderer because that would carry some moral implication. Well, yes, it turns out that murdering entire families, slaughtering entire families, burning them. I mean, some of the stuff that I've been that I've been tweeting out, which is stuff I'm getting, again, directly from first responders on the ground. I mean, just a few moments ago, I tweeted. I wish I didn't have to tweet out these photos, but I think people need to understand the consequences. I actually I want to hear their actual explanation. Sorry, I just found it. Government ministers, newspaper columnists, ordinary people, they're all asking why the BBC doesn't say that the Hamas gunmen who carried out the appalling atrocities in southern Israel are terrorists. The answer goes right back to the BBC's founding principles. Terrorism is a loaded word which people use about an outfit they disapprove of morally. It's simply not the BBC's job to tell people who to support and who to condemn, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. We regularly point out that the British and other governments have condemned Hamas as a terrorist organisation, but that's their business. Sorry, it's only the left, I know. To present our audience with the facts and let them make the their own minds up facts. what they think. As it happens, of course, many of the people who've attacked us for not using the word terrorist have seen our pictures or heard our audio and made up their own minds on the basis of our reporting. So it's not as though we're- Ironic. BBC, do you condemn Hamas? <laughs> okay. I wonder if the BBC condemns Hamas. I actually, I don't know. I can't, I can't fucking tell. I will, we need to get to the bottom of this because this guy, this guy's being evasive. He's being as evasive as Hassan with this question. Hiding the truth in any way, far from it. Any reasonable person would be appalled by the kind of thing we've seen. It's perfectly right to call the incidents that have occurred atrocities because that's exactly what they are. We don't take sides. We don't use loaded words like evil or cowardly. We don't talk about terrorists. And we're not the only ones to follow this line. Some of the world's most respected <laughs> news organizations have exactly this the guy's same delivery policy. Is so funny. But the BBC gets particular attention, partly because we've got a lot of critics in politics <laughs> and in the press, and partly because we're rightly held to an especially high standard. Yeah. But part of keeping to that standard is to be objective as it's possible to be. That's why people in Britain and right around the world in huge numbers watch, read, and listen to what we say every single day. Chud logic in 60 years. They're just a different breed, these BBC guys. I don't know. Of failing to see evil for what it is, it was a it was a photo of some a group of people in in a kibbutz called Kibbutz Be'eri, which is again near the border where 100 bodies were found, and they were attempting to simply escape. And Hamas stopped the car and burned these people alive. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I don't know how you don't call that. The, uh, what other group <laughs> <do> you have <laughs> <to> <laughs> the morality of the situation? 
if if you refuse to call things what what they are, I don't. It, it's it boggles the mind. It really it, it truly does. I mean, it would also boggle the mind for me. So would, would they be okay if um, they described settlements as colonialism on the BBC? Would they be okay with that? Hmm. Hmm. was at Black Lives Matter Chicago, which had a Twitter account with 60,000 followers. They actually posted a caricature image of a paraglider saying, I stand with Palestine. The paragliders were, of course, <laughs> were the ones who flew in and killed all the people oh, at no. the music festival. What did you feel when you saw that? I mean, unsurprising, only in the sense that Black Lives Matter as, a, as an organization had all it sorts is. of solidarity statements. <laughs> Absent the context, it's such it's such a funny fucking picture. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's fucking horrible. But like, was it BLM Chicago that did this? What a bunch of morons! God, surprising only in the sense that Black Lives Matter, as, a, as an uh -oh. organization, had all sorts of solidarity statements about Palestine going all the way back to uh, the the original movement in 2014, 2015. Um, but the but seeing them actively take up the the imagery of an actual terrorist attack, that's what that is. Palestinians are not famous for their for their hang gliding. I mean, the only reason why yep. that is the image is because literal terrorists use paragliders in order to murder civilians at an electronic dance music festival. By the way, attended mostly by people of the political left. I mean, those are not right wing Israelis who are dancing in EDM festival. On, on a Saturday. That's not the way that, that works. Um, it's it, it was it, a fake BLM account. Wait, is that true? <laughs> Wait, what? No way. Well, these guys, this was a fake BLM account. NGO formed from Ferguson Freedom Rights. That's what BLM said. It's not actually a chapter. Oh, it's just like a Twitter account. Wait, really? Where's their link tree go? Hang on. Oh, it's just, uh, they're just not affiliated with the the national BLM or oh, okay, okay, that would make sense. They're like an independent. Okay. Huh. Oh well, still don't like BLM Chicago. Fuck them. Can paraglider. It, it's only astonishing in, in either the moral blindness okay. or the anti-Semitism. And at I a mean, certain point, the moral blindness becomes detail. the anti-Semitism because when you are celebrating active Jew murder and you are saying that that's solidarity, that, that's a pretty incredible thing. I'd also like to point out here that the argument in favor of Palestinian self-determination did not need to be threatened by any of these people. All they could have said is Hamas does not represent Palestinians. This does not have any implications for Palestinian self-determination. Mm -hmm. Hamas is a terrorist group and they ought to be right. eviscerated and they ought to be replaced by a better government that could make peace with like, None of this is particularly hard. The fact that they're lumping together Hamas with the Palestinian cause says an awful lot and it doesn't mm. say anything good. In one of the videos, you say the only... That was an interesting curve there from Ben. I didn't expect him to say that. He never really said he believes it himself because he does believe that all Palestinian representation since the fucking dawn of time has been terrorists. He won't say it, but again, like he actually did steal, did, did like do a good steel man of what you could say as a leftist for when it came to Hamas. Damn. That's what I mean, though. He's not a dumb person. He's just a fucking propagandist, like, partisan psycho. But, um, yeah. Wow. Again, we've seen the polls. Hamas were struggling before the 7th when it came to popularity. They've had problems for a while. solution is for Israel to annex the Gaza Strip and kill enough sons of bitches to make sure this isn't a problem again. Mm. You say anyone who calls for a ceasefire is a terrorist sympathizer under these circumstances. Now that got a lot of pushback. Interesting. Uh, I guess this comes to the point of appropriate response. How far do you go? Right. How do you isolate genuine Hamas from perhaps completely innocent Palestinians in Gaza, of which there will be many? Um, one person called you a genocidal warmonger for that rhetoric. And there's a, a, a mm. person called Mohammed Hijab in a video called in oh, responding to Ben Shapiro on Israel. He says this. This guy's crazy. First and foremost, I'll say, yes, we condemn oh. any woman, child, or whatever it may be that's being killed who's Jewish Both sides. not a non-combatant. But why is it the case, Ben? Okay. Huh? <laughs> why is it the case that you, 
None of <laughs> your colleagues or you have been able to okay. offer one single condolence, one single condemnation, one single word of sympathy for any of the Gazans that have been killed. Don't try and smear us. Don't try and slander us. Don't try and attack. Don't try and produce red earrings. And I think you're an ass. A jackass. <laughs> and we're not talking about Hamas. We're talking about children here. We're okay. talking about women here. We're talking about elderly people. You make me sick. You make me sick. Well, what's your response to that, Ben? I mean, that will be, I'm sure, a reaction you've heard from a lot of people. What do you feel about that? I mean, the, my obvious response is, of course, I feel horrible for the people who are being held by Hamas in a state Hamas of fault. tyranny. For the IDF would never go beyond reasonable proportions. They'd never do that. It's not even, it's unheard of. Past 15 years. The Nakba was just Arabs were mad that Israelis got a state. They were just like, we don't, Jew country, no, that's a Nakba catastrophe. Yeah, that's what happened. Hamas was the elected government in Gaza in 2006. There hasn't been an election since then. Uh, all the people who are who are today ranting, as, as you heard Mohammed Hijab doing right there, I, I don't hear them talking about liberating Gaza from Hamas, which is the greatest threat to the to the way of life of Gazans on planet Earth. Again, I have nothing but sympathy for Hamas uh, for for the people that Hamas is is governing or the people that Hamas is exploiting. Really, I have nothing but sympathy for civilians there. Israel has to defend itself. I don't understand exactly what the expectation would be here. Is the, is the expectation that... Why do you keep talking about 1948? I don't know. I just like that number. I just really like the number 1948. I just like saying Nakba. Um, this makes me happy, you know? And because Ben Shapiro famously flat out denies it. He doesn't even say, oh, there was a war. No, he just said, like, self-defense, you know, atrocities happen in, in war. You know, it's, the, it's not nice, but it's just what happens. No, he just says that it's only called, it's called the Nakba because they were angry that there was a Jewish state. <laughs> like, which is such an insane proposal, yeah. Because Hamas uses human shields, that Israel therefore has to go home and wait to, be, to, to have its people murdered again. Now, Israel tried it the way that, that Mohammed Hijab and others would like. Israel what? literally pulled in 2005. He's a Jew, what do you expect? Okay, okay. When I say that watching the Israeli reaction to this is making me anti-Semitic, it's a fucking joke, you moron. Fuck off. Take a time out. I'm allowed to make that joke because I know me, right? You guys know my content. I'm not gonna be like, take a fucking joke like that from chat and be like, oh, <laughs> Yeah, it's okay, you know. Refer to your previous videos. It's clearly a joke. No, I don't know. Fuck, I don't know who you guys are. Five. They literally pulled thousands of Jews out of the Gaza Strip. It was called the disengagement. And it was massively unpopular in wide swaths of Israel. They, they pulled out, they built a wall, and they basically said, go ahead and govern yourselves. And this is the result of that. You think Israel, you think I, you think anyone in Israel, no one in Israel wants to reoccupy the Gaza Strip. No one. That's why Israel has been studiously avoiding reoccupying the Gaza Strip since 2006, despite the fact that they have been living underground in large parts of Israel for weeks at a time because of rocket attacks that have been fired on a regular basis from the Gaza Strip into major cities. But let me Tel ask you, Aviv, let me ask you this, Ben. Ashdod. Yeah, but the problem with Ben's approaches and with the right-wing approaches, okay, you don't want to govern the Gaza Strip. You also don't want to give them statehood. So what? They just... It feels like your life would be a lot easier, like your ideology kind of makes sense if you would just take any opportunity to boot them out of Gaza and take it back. <clears throat> like it's an unsustainable, what Ben is advocating for is completely unsustainable and it kind of makes shit like this inevitable. Yeah. In Gaza, you have 2 million people, many of whom are young people, pretty hopeless conditions to live in. I think people would agree with that. Uh, not much chance of getting out of there. Uh, they live in very densely populated areas. We know from in the last 24 hours that Israel controls water, mm -hmm. controls energy, power going in there. Is he going to bring uh, up the water pipes? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, many would see that that is a control that Israel shouldn't have if you want to afford equal rights to people living in, in Gaza. And then it comes down to proportionate response and how you try and, like I say, how do you, how do you attack Hamas, given they're all over Gaza, living amongst the general population? How do you attack and isolate genuine members of Hamas, Jesus. genuine 
uh, terrorists from the civilian population. And given that is almost impossible, clearly, what is a proportionate response to what's happened here? Well, I, frankly, I don't believe in proportionate response to terrorism. I believe that the way that you stop terrorism is with wildly disproportionate response. That doesn't mean in terms of targeting civilians. It means in terms of killing as many terrorists as humanly possible and allowing them to dictate the terms of engagement by hiding behind civilians in areas that, that they are supposedly responsible for means that the only option for Israel is to surrender to Hamas's hatred of its own citizens, its willingness to use its own children as human shields. No, no country worth its salt. By the way, also... <clears throat> Maybe he does believe that Israel wants nothing to do with um, Gaza and Hamas. But again, just in case any of the uh, Kefels viewers are still here, um, we do know that this, this was part of Netanyahu's strategy between 2013 and 2018 was to allow money from Qatar to get into uh, Gaza, knowing that it would go to Hamas and keep them strong. Because the strategy was to s divide Gaza from the West Bank. to keep Hamas and the PA separate. So, like, we know this now. We know that he's admitted it. So, um, that it's a, it was a divide and conquer strategy. And even in 2019, like, this is, like, I can't go over this quote. Like, this is from 2019. Someone said um, that we Gaza border residents are paying the price for the lack of policy and the arrogance in facing terror. Like, Because that's their first, like their first principle is no Palestinian state. Like the, the first thing they want is no Palestinian state. <clears throat> and actually having Hamas divide, uh, fragmenting <clears throat> the Palestinian leadership is actually a good thing for that. And they're kind of paying the price for that philosophy. Like. <clears throat> Link, please. Uh, I'll put it in the YouTube chat, shall I? could ever do that. No no government trying to protect its own citizens could ever do that. What exactly are, is the alternative option other than for Israel to try to kill as many of these terrorists and oppose Hamas and hopefully help put in place some sort of international overseen community that would actually govern the Gaza Strip in a, in a rational, reasonable way that actually maximizes the possibilities of its citizens? Israel, over the course of the last year, allowed some 15,000 work permits to Gazans. Many of those work permits we're now finding out were used by terrorists in order to cross the border. The, the fact that Israel controls the water and the power, the reason that Israel controls the water and the power is specifically because if they did not control the water and the power, Hamas would be right now holed up with the water and the power indefinitely. I mean, the fact is that the reason that Israel controls, for example, the sea border is because if they did not, there were attempts to ship weapons in from Turkey multiple times. It, the, 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 impossible situation in which Israel finds itself with regard to the Gaza Strip is mirrored only by the impossible situation which, in, in which Gazan civilians find themselves and all of that. Every single I think there's, so again, like trying to be realistic, you could make an argument that a lot of Israel's measures around Gaza are to do with security um, as long as Hamas is still there. Uh, that's partially true, that doesn't, but that doesn't explain, you have to look for Israeli policies that don't really have anything to do with security. So one of them is, is that because Israel controls the water and the uh, food imports, they decide how much water and food each Palestinian gets. So the recommended minimum for water per person is 100 liters a day, and Palestinians get 70 liters. There's no security justification for that. There's no security cause for that. See? Oh, it's a week, sorry, yeah. Is it? Wait, actually. No, average person uses 145 liters a day. Like, it's not just drinking, it's fucking water and fucking cleaning and shit. What are you talking about? It's water, not like, like, bottle, not like just for drinking. Yeah. Palestinians in the West Bank get 82 liters a person. How much is it in Gaza? It must be less. Palestinians can see on average 73. So for Gaza, it would be like, 
if it's up to it would be like a bit under just around seven about 60 or something yeah so they get it's quite low and there's no security and the yeah the un recommended minimum is uh 100 or the world health organization one of those organizations um in a pretty hot part of the world as well so yeah iota of that is the result of hamas which means unless there is a change in status in which hamas is removed from power in which someone else is put in charge this is going to continue again but I would it's per day though right because people have showers and shit that's why people in palestine like or people who visit palestine are encouraged to like take shorter showers right because they'll run out otherwise I would even argue, 10, 000, 10, 000 Jews like, want I, to die I, I, going I, into the Gaza ben, Strip in order I, I to agree. defend their citizens? So I agree with you, but yeah. I would also say that I think that it would also benefit any chance of a peace settlement that if Netanyahu wasn't in charge anymore. Ooh, um, true. I mean, apart from anything else, this is an unbelievable breach and failure of, of security and military. I think part of that can be apportioned to the extraordinary social unrest that's been enveloping Israel since his cabinet full of a lot of right-wing hegbangers, frankly, some of whom have actually called themselves fascists, uh, have tried to take on the judiciary and the Supreme Court. Also, 86% of people blame uh, Netanyahu's leadership. I don't feel comfortable the about attacks. that. What do you feel about that? And do you feel that Netanyahu is the right person? Mm. Should, does it need a completely clean leadership now, both in Palestine and Israel, to try mm. and get to somewhere approaching peace? The Zizek approach. The democratically elected government of Israel has not had a change in policy, despite the fact that, until very recently, Netanyahu was not the prime minister of Israel. It was a joint government run by Naftali Bennett, as well as by Yair Lapid, who's a member of the hard left who dramatically opposes Benjamin Netanyahu. Today, they formed a unity government between Benny Gantz, who's a member of the center left, and Benjamin Netanyahu, who's a member of the center right Likud party in Israel. This is not when it comes to foreign policy. The reality is that since the rejection of any peace deal by Mahmoud Abbas in 2009, when Ehud Olmert was the prime minister of Israel, there's been very little disagreement. Where is this the napkin accords? It's the napkin accords. This is the this is the proposal where <laughs> where um, Abbas was shown the map. But he wasn't allowed to take a copy with it, a copy of it, to study it, to like consider the proposal, because it's a map. Maps are important if you want to consider the land swaps. So, in a kind of like protest gesture, the only fucking funny thing, the only good thing Abbas has ever done, ever, was he, um, he drew it on a napkin and was like, this is what they showed me <laughs> from memory. Like what a what a deeply fucking unserious proposal. Also, I think a lot of Ehud Ehud Elmert's uh, Ehud Olmert, sorry, uh, his statements regarding Palestinians do kind of suggest that he's not serious about peace. Let me see. I want let's see the terms of it actually. I think there's like a summary of the terms. When the papers were published, uh, negotiations were in a deadlock after the refusal in September 2010 of the Benjamin Netanyahu government to extend the freeze of settlement building over 10 months. Refugee issue wasn't properly represented. Napkin map is a colloquial name for a Palestinian sketch made by Mahmoud Abbas on a napkin of a map with land swap proposals shown to him by then Prime Minister Ehud Olmert during peace negotiations in mid-2008. According to Al Jazeera, Abbas was not allowed to keep the unofficial map, so he sketched it by hand. During the first of several meetings, the Palestinian Authority proposed a land swap, offering Israel the opportunity to annex all of the Israeli settlements in East Jerusalem in return for land concessions by Israel. Olmert, however, offered no concessions in return, but an even more aggressive land swap. It's like, why? The, the framing of this is so fucking... Like, it's so snaky. It's, it's so dishonest. The 
between any of the parties with regard to foreign policy. If statements mean you're not serious about peace, how are actions like this going to work? What? Like, I don't think Hamas are serious about peace. No, I don't think, I think before Hamas's actions, they're, they're probably not going to be the ones to negotiate peace. What are you talking about? What? Okay. Because they do not have a peace partner. The Oslo process was killed by the Palestinians, and it was killed by the Palestinians when they rejected multiple peace offerings. You by a fucking liar, bro. Oh my God. Who else re rejected Oslo? Netanyahu did. His whole party did. Hang on. What happened to the Israeli Prime Minister who put through Oslo? Where is it? He was fucking assassinated by a right-wing Israeli. Netanyahu said that his government was removed from Jewish tradition and Jewish values. You know what else Netanyahu did? For anyone who hasn't heard it before, he fucking, he led a protest against Rabin, against the Oslo Accords, while people behind him were carrying fucking fake coffins, chanting death to Rabin. Stochastic terrorism and shit. Netanyahu led a mock funeral procession featuring a coffin and a hangman's noose. The chief of international security alerted Netanyahu of a plot of, on Rabin's life and asked him to moderate the protest rhetoric, which Netanyahu declined to do. <laughs> Netanyahu, Netanyahu, Netanyahu before, um, <laughs> by the late 90s. Netanyahu was prime minister in the late 90s for a brief period during the Oslo Accords, while they were still going. Uh, do you know what he did when he was prime minister? He increased the expansion of settlements. Like, dramatically. While they're trying to fucking negotiate land swaps around the settlements. Like, yeah, fuck off. Ehud Barak, by Ariel Sharon, by Ehud Olmert, over and over and over again, by Yitzhak Rabin, by Shimon Peres. By Ariel Sharon? <laughs> parties with regard to foreign policy because they do not have a peace partner. The Oslo process was killed by the Palestinians and it was killed by the Palestinians when they rejected multiple peace offerings by Ehud Barak, by Ariel Sharon, by Ehud Olmert, over and over and over again. What peace talk, what peace accord did Ariel Sharon offer? Am I, wait, am I wrong? What the fuck did Ariel Sharon offer? He comes in in 2000, uh, when was Ariel Sharon elected? Was it 2000, 2001? He was elected in March 2001. What peace offering did he make? He rejected Taba. He rejected, um, he rejected Geneva. And he rejected the Arab Peace Accords. He rejected all of them. One of them, actually, Taba was actually ongoing. The reason Taba ended was because um, Barack was kicked out. Iraq, Barack lost an election to Sharon. And Sharon came in and abandoned them. Was it the Taba summit? Hmm. Barack terminated the talks due to an upcoming election, and then Sharon didn't restart them. He's just a, he's just a liar. He's a fucking liar. It's a really easy topic to lie about as well, because people just don't know. by Yitzhak Rabin, by Shimon Peres. Benjamin Netanyahu himself in the Y River Accords of 1998 handed over significant portions of the West Bank to the Palestinians. So, Which of them met Arafat Akam David, um, Ehud Barak? You can say that Netanyahu's a problem. That's fine. But the reality no, no, is I was that asking if, if you whether you, I was asking you whether you feel he is a problem, that actually all the division that's been caused by his attempt to usurp the power of the Supreme Court, as many people see it, all that division in Israel has actually diminished his authority uh, and that it's come at a time when you really need somebody with real authority. Well, I mean, I, I don't think that right now that's really the question, considering, again, it's a unity government and I'm talking to everybody in Israel and all of those divisions heal up in a moment when your children are being slaughtered at the border, as it turns out. So, you know, all of the judicial reform 
conversation is a separate conversation. We can critique how fast they went in, in terms of this coalition. They went too fast. They scaled it back. There were serious divisions in Israeli society about what kind of power the judiciary ought to have. There are many people on both sides, actually, who believe the judiciary had too much power. There are a lot of people on both sides who believe the government went too fast on that. Internal political divisions have become completely irrelevant here. If, if Netanyahu were replaced tomorrow by Benny Gantz, which is what a lot of Israelis would hope for, if, if that were to happen literally tomorrow, nothing would change. Mm. Nothing would change. And the reason nothing would change is because, again, this is an issue. This particular issue is about Hamas. This has nothing to do with the constituency of the Israeli government. You could find the most left-wing person in, in Israeli politics right now, which would be Yair Lapid. You could put him back in the prime minister's seat, and he would be forced with exactly the same decisions that Netanyahu is faced with right now. How do you see— Is Lapid actually left, or is he, like, Israeli liberal? I think Israeli left just doesn't actually exist. Like, they just don't have the power at all. They're not represented. Um, I could be. He's center. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Hard left, according to Benny. Yeah. yeah. Take me forward 20 years. In a dream scenario, how does the region look? Hmm. In a dream scenario, economic development, which I think is what the Abraham Accords were about and what the burgeoning Saudi peace deal was about. And by the way, the burgeoning Saudi peace deal is the reason that Hamas did this at the behest of Iran. They were afraid of a regional Ooh, realignment that would create a Sunni Jewish alliance. Right oriented largely against the, the, the Shia power Saudi. of Iran, which is spread through Lebanon, Syria, and now down into, into Hamasistan. Uh, the, the Didn't Israel used to be super lefty back in the day, uh, in the Soviet sphere almost? Uh, I mean, like if you're not, they didn't want to represent Arabs, but as, as socialist as you can be like that, yeah. Like, kind of, not really. Um, like they identified as socialist. Soviet Union was the first uh, state to give Israel de jure recognition, though. That's true. The first state to give Israel official recognition after 48 was the Soviet Union. Yeah, the, the economic development is the only way to move forward for the region. That was the premise of the Abraham Accords. Again, it was the premise of the, the nascent Saudi peace deal. Israel would love to do that with the Palestinian Authority. They would love to do that with, with anyone governing the Palestinians to provide better economic conditions. I mean, one of the great ironies of all this is that 20 percent of Israel's population is Arab. The, the Arabs in Israel earn a far better income. They, they have far better GDP per capita than Arabs who are living under the Palestinian Authority or under the Gaza or under the or under Hamas. And when you take polls of Israeli Arabs, many of whom are not particularly fond of the state of Israel, almost zero of them wish to actually relocate to any of these areas because economic development. I wonder is why people would rather live in a normal in a state than under occupation. I wonder why. <laughs> economic development. The, the way they have higher GDP per capita. Yeah, that just doesn't make sense, does it? out of this is that but in order for that to happen the people on the other side of the table have to actually agree that economic development is a worthwhile thing is an end goal and this goes back to the original point that i was making is that we in the west we believe the economic development worthwhile that what we are all seeking is the same sort of peaceful decent life where we leave each other alone and get to live our lives i think that we all we all agree on that but there's a group of people who absolutely do not agree with that and they don't care about the level of economic development they would rather live i mean hamas would rather that its own citizens live in poverty and penury and orient themselves against the extermination of the Jews, then that economic development even be allowed to take place. I mean, do you, do you I, believe, I know everyone do you believe in the Israeli government, I, I promise you, yeah. everyone in the Israeli government, right to left, would love nothing better than economic development of the people surrounding them so they don't have to send their sons and daughters to go fight and die in Gaza. Do, do you believe in the concept of a two-state solution? I mean, if there were a party on the other side to negotiate with, and if, there, if, the, if the possibility of a two-state solution was real, sure. I mean, but the question is, how realistic is that? Negotiations cannot be the 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 cure all. You can't. You have to have a partner on the other side of the table. The entire premise of the Oslo Accords is that you could take an actual terrorist by the name of Yasser Arafat. You could you could negotiate with him. You could make a deal with him, and this would magically cure the situation. Well, a deal is not capable of being cut with with literally anyone. That's not the way any of this works. So in order for there to be any sort of long-term peace, including a Palestinian state, there would have to be a complete difference in, in leadership in, in these areas. And that would actually require Palestinian moderates to take the floor. The Palestinian Authority is not, a, is not a moderate group. Islamic Jihad is a terrorist group. Hamas is a terrorist group. And until that changes, nothing's going to change. And by the way, there is the possibility of that change. If you had told me 10 years ago that there would be Saudi-Israeli normalization on the table, mm. I would have laughed in your face. If you told me that Israel would have been able to cut peace deals with the UAE and with Morocco, I, I, would, have, I would have scoffed. And yeah. I think everyone would have scoffed. So there is that possibility. But again, I would also, you cannot make peace with a side that wants to murder you. That is not a possibility. Well, on that point, uh, all I would say to that... It's, it's so... 
The problem is, is that this attitude is just like so prevalent amongst the Israeli right, and this is why they've managed to stay. But like, the problem is, is Ben Shapiro sounds, well, first of all, he's lying about like how much will there has been to negotiate on the other side. But also, the way he talks, like, oh, they're just impossible, like, you can't negotiate with these people, you can't negotiate, like, this pure, just like aggressive, like, he sounds like someone who can't be negotiated with. And that's true, because that's what the Israeli right are. They've never want, they've never been interested in doing that. Like the things that he wants from Palestinians are basically things that they'll never accept or basically like terms of surrender. You think Ben Shapiro would offer like equal land swaps for settlements or would be willing to even dismantle a few settlements? Of course he wouldn't because he thinks like that's why he calls it Judea Samaria, right? Because he like he believes it belongs to Israel. Hang on, what's this? Has like, I don't want to call it regime. Was Fatah democratically elected? Uh, in 1990 in, uh, in Okay. In like two, in the two thousands in the mid two thousands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, um, Hamas got rid of elections in Gaza in two thousand six, I believe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So anything before two thousand six, you can assume was a free and fair election. Yeah, Feta have popular standards. Feta has popular members. Has like, I don't want to. The guy who said that to me was like. <laughs> the guy who said that to, I can't remember who was this guy talking to Erudite I don't think Hamash are the ones who suppressed elections I think that was um, PA but okay wow whoops um, how do I do that misinformation box I know terrible that is, I'm an Irish Catholic, and we had the troubles in Northern Ireland. Different circumstances, I'm not going to try and equate the two. Uh, but there you had people on both sides trying to kill each other. You had the IRA trying to kill civilians uh, indiscriminately to make their political points. And in the end, a peace deal was achieved, but it was achieved by people sitting down opposite people they knew had been killing civilians and killing people on their side. You even had the Queen meeting Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams, who were the, uh, you know, in McGuinness's case, the former chief of staff of the IRA. He ordered some of the most appalling atrocities. The Queen, one of her own relatives, was blown to pieces, uh, Lord Mountbatten, by the IRA, but she still met with them. I was actually at Number 10 Downing Street when Tony Blair met McGuinness and Adams on the steps for the first time in, in 70 years uh, as the members of Sinn Féin and shook their hands. I was next in to see him in his office. And it was a, an extraordinary moment to watch. And it was a moment many people thought would never happen. Um, do you see any parallel there in terms of what could be achieved with Israel and Palestine? Only if the leadership changes. Only if the leadership changes on the Palestinian side. That is the only way that happens. And again, the, uh, the, the difference here is that the IRA had territorial ambitions. Hamas does not have territorial ambitions. They have genocidal ambitions. The Palestinian Authority has been offered multiple deals over multiple decades, and they have rejected, without counteroffers, virtually every deal they have ever been offered. Islamic Jihad is a terrorist group. Again, if, if the IRA was dedicated to the complete slaughter and eradication of every non-Irish Britisher in the UK, mm. that would be the equivalent of Hamas. And that would not be a negotiating position because, again, could there be successful negotiations? With, it, depends on, it depends on the partner. Right. I mean, the, the, the example that you're using is, is the best example of sides that are incredibly far apart coming together. But here we are talking about one side that, simple premise, if Israel put down all of its guns tomorrow... Sorry, one second. Sorry, just total Every Jew in the region would be space. slaughtered. If Hamas put down all of its guns tomorrow, Israel would leave the Gaza Strip alone. It is that simple. Let me ask you, you got into a, a, a Twitter spat with Andrew Tate yesterday. He's a converted Muslim. He'd been doing a lot of uh, supportive tweets uh, for the Palestinians. And he tweeted at you at one stage, Mr. Tough Guy, let me assure you, as someone who's done his own fighting, as opposed to excitedly encouraging others to do it for him while sitting at home on a comfy chair, peace is always worth a conversation. What, what was that spat about? Why did you engage with him? What do you feel about that? 
uh, well, what I feel about that is that he was tweeting that immediately, like as terrorists were still running around in southern mm, Israel. That was on October 10th. And he was still tweeting while the bodies were fresh and warm in the streets. Peace is that you cannot make peace with people who murder your children and burn their bodies. You can't do that. I mean, th- this this rush to Israel, I, I, th- the murder happens and you immediately say, okay, well, guys, now truce, now truce, now ceasefire. That is not, no state worth its salt, no government on earth would allow the, this kind of insanity. No government on earth. And no government on earth would listen to nonsense about how you immediately have to seek peace with a group that seeks your direct extermination. Again, I, I can't emphasize it enough. Israel turned over the Gaza Strip two Gazans in 2005. Mm. Hamas has governed the area since 2006. The year is currently 2023. Israel has, in, has in, endured round after round of rocket fire on its major cities for literally almost 20 years. And now the idea is the minute that Gazan, that, that Gazan terrorists rush through the border and murder people in their beds, that's the time for a peace conversation? That's um, the time for a peace conversation? Say, By the way, and, and I'm not going to be left... It may, it's maybe a good time to acknowledge failures of the past, but... <laughs> Like, like it seems most Israelis are doing with Netanyahu regards to security. And also, I, it seems to be the case that Netanyahu is actually up for uh, bolstering Hamas, is, is becoming part of the conversation in Israel. So I, I hope. But again, I don't know. Israelis are going to go fucking mental and hawkish and shit, yeah. ...on morality and toughness by, by Andrew Tate, whose great idea of toughness and morality is pimping women and then bragging about it on air and... and trying to quasi-walk it back while simultaneously maintaining many of the same positions and flexing his biceps. I mean, he's got a huge following, as you know, especially online. Uh, is, it, is it dangerous? Is it reckless that he's able to tweet from house arrest still, of course, in Romania, that he can tweet on something like this and have the kind of influence that he has? Listen, everyone should be able to tweet whatever it is that they want. I'm all for an open discourse, even with people who I think are dead wrong on a lot of these issues. But Andrew Tate is dead wrong on a lot of these issues. And, and the, the particularly ridiculous posturing about being a, a, a yes, you're very, yes, you're, you're very tough when you, when you want people to make peace with, with terrorists who just murder their children. Very, very tough. You mentioned Iran earlier. Uh, President Biden yesterday came out, 10 minute speech, you know, sounded very tough and very supportive of Israel, but never once mentioned Iran. Was that a, a failure by him? Or are they waiting to establish concrete evidence of Iran's involvement? So I think there's a good reason he could have done that and a bad reason that he could have done that. And the, the bad reason is pretty obvious, which is that the United States has unfrozen $6 billion in assets to, to flood into Iran in return for hostages. That money is fungible. And there's every possibility that money flowing into Iran since, since the weakening of sanctions has contributed to Iran's spread of terror. That is not only a possibility, that's a probability, and everyone knows it. So if you avoid mentioning Iran, then presumably it avoids blowback. That is the bad reason. The good reason might be that the United States wants to take down the temperature in the region. So right now, geopolitically, this is a contained conflict. This is Israel versus Hamas in the Gaza Strip, and everyone of good heart on every side should hope that it remains that way. If Hezbollah, which is on Israel's northern border and is an Mm -hmm. Iranian client, uh, Hezbollah is a massive and significantly more powerful than Hamas terrorist group that exists and, and has say in the government of Lebanon. Again, Israel is surrounded on a lot of sides by terrorist groups that masquerade as government. Uh, Hezbollah has about 150,000 much more sophisticated rockets than, than Hamas pointed at northern Israel. Everyone understands that if Hezbollah, which would only do this at the behest of Iran, if, if Hezbollah were to get in, Israel would then be stretched militarily to the point where they would not have any choice but to go full force. Ooh. And what that means is that all of the talk right now about the, the supposed disproportionate force that Israel is using in the Gaza Strip, talk with which I wildly disagree, uh, that, that will all go out the window because once you are stretched to the point of extermination, all bets are off. And, and the Israeli Air Force will have to be unleashed on the, on the southern border of Lebanon. At that point, you'd have to imagine that, that Bashar Assad in Syria starts to get active, Iran starts to get active. So one of the things that, that the, the possible good reason why he didn't mention Iran is because he's attempting to keep Iran out of the war. That basically the idea would be, he did say in the speech that any other group that wants to get in, don't. America, to its great credit, to our great credit, we've stationed a, a battle carrier, an aircraft carrier outside of uh, outside of Lebanon in, in the Mediterranean and basically said to Hezbollah that they should not get in. Uh, that is, in fact, the, the best available move. So, again, there's a very plausible bad reason why he didn't mention Iran, which is to avoid the blowback from his own idiotic Iran policy. And there's a possible good reason, which is that he's attempting to avoid the broadening of the conflict. Donald Trump says, as he's wont to do with these crises, that it would never have happened if he was president, uh, do you think that may have some truth? I think there's some truth to that, for sure. I, I think that, that, that Iran has seen weakness. Iran saw an opportunity to, to prevent the Saudis from coming into to the Abraham Accords. 
And uh, they thought that they could push where they saw mush. I mean, the withdrawal from Afghanistan made America look weak. The continuous dealings between the United States and Iran, despite Iran's openly genocidal intentions with regard to Israel, uh, has made America look weak. The fact that Robert Malley, who is one of the chief negotiators for the United States, was apparently co-opted by Iranian intelligence groups, makes the Americans look look particularly weak. And so appearances of weakness in the Middle East matter an awful lot. It is it is not politics in Western states you know, where, where we try to negotiate, we try to have discussions. That is not how politics works in the Middle East. It is a place where strength is, is really the only point of the realm. There is a theory that Hamas have done this spectacularly awful act of terrorism deliberately on a scale that would goad Israel into overreacting and spark a much, a much wider war. I mean, I think that there's probably truth to that. I think that, that Hamas, I think that's what Iran wants. I'm not sure that Hamas wanted that. I think Hamas uh, doesn't want to be wiped off the earth, which they probably will be and, and ought to be. Um, but I think that, that Iran's hope was that Israel would have to go in incredibly strong into the Gaza Strip, and this would provide internal pressure in Saudi Arabia to prevent them from forming an alliance brokered by the Americans. I think the Saudi thing with Israel is probably, I think it's frozen now, isn't it? Is that true? Hamas attack might freeze. Hmm. I thought it most likely, most likely won't kill it. I got, that's really hard to predict because it depends on what Israel does in Gaza, right? Because I think for, as far as Saudi goes, like part of their conditions is that Israel doesn't, okay, isn't like, is a bit less horrible to the Palestinians. But I don't know if they care that much, to be honest. Palestinians have been sold out by every fucking other Arab country that goes normalizing with Israel. So, yeah. With the Israelis, I think that's Rogers and Tower. It said it's frozen. Yeah, that's what I would have thought. Yeah, the geopolitical reason for that. With that said, that does not mean that Israel has any other choice. Again, if if suddenly fifteen hundred terrorists flooded into Great Britain and proceeded to murder fifteen to twenty thousand people, because again, Israel's a tiny, tiny country. It has nine million people. Uh, if if those numbers were made proportionate. If, if tens of thousands of people were slaughtered in Britain by a group of terrorists, I, I doubt that there'd be a lot of British citizens who are sitting around worrying about proportionality or worrying about the geopolitical consequences of protecting their own citizenry. There is a, I mean, an interesting uh, contradiction, I would argue, that a lot of uh, conservatives in America, a lot of Republicans, have, including a number of presidential candidates, from Ron DeSantis to Trump uh, and others, um, they have signaled that they would want to severely curtail, if not stop altogether, support for Ukraine, and yet Ukraine was invaded um, by Russia. Um, a lot of people slaughtered, continue to be slaughtered. Um, is there not a contradiction there that these Republicans yes. Yes. would be I mean, yes. full square <laughs> behind Israel when it happens to them, but not full square behind Ukraine? I mean, yes, there is a contradiction. It depends on, on sort of what is being said about Ukraine, and, and it runs the gamut. And some of the candidates that you've talked about have talked about ending aid completely to Ukraine. Some have talked about continuing aid to Ukraine and, and pursuing some okay. sort of, of deal with I the Russians. I actually don't know what Shapiro's position is on Ukraine. Hmm. That allows them to keep part of the Donbass and Crimea, which I think is a completely different story and, and is an actual off-ramp. Um, but yes, anybody who is, who is you know, sympathetic to Russia in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and then is sympathetic to Israel in this current conflict, uh, that, that, that is a, a bizarre position to take. And again, I think that they're serious. Mm -hmm. America's a sovereign country. It has its own concerns that are not Israel's concerns, and it has its own concerns that are not Ukraine's concerns. And those, don't, th those zones always line up. Um, but when it comes to you know, a possible contradiction between a completely isolationist position on Ukraine and, a, and an interventionist position or a supportive position on Israel, uh, of course, those things could, could clearly be in conflict. In my own position, by the way, on, for what it's worth, since I, you know, as you know, Piers, I do this for a living, uh, it, my own position on Ukraine has been that the United States should continue to supply Ukraine with the support necessary in order to preserve its government and to preserve its territory. And meanwhile, there need to be serious talks about what exactly an off-ramp looks like in Ukraine, because virtually no one has spelled out exactly what that looks like. And virtually no one believes at this point that Ukraine is going to be able to completely take back both the Donbass and, and the Crimea region. Uh, that, that is I mean, not it's very complicated. I mean, I, I, having been Ukraine. to Ukraine and interviewed President Zelensky. OK, we're um, off Palestine. That's fine. Oh, God, what a slimy fuck. What a dishonest cunt. Anyway. Um... I mean, you can see the mandate that um, you can see the mandate that uh, peace negotiations were given in the first election of the uh, 
in the nineties. Hang on, the PLF, PLA, election, Palestine. Yeah, the general election in 1996. You can see the mandate that they were given for peace accords. It was like 89%. And Hamas did uh, boycott this election, but their polling was only around 15%. So it's not like they would have made a huge dent. The Oslo Accords were very, very, they were, they were embraced um, by Palestinians with a lot of optimism. And even if you look at polling for later accords, even during the Second Intifada, like, there were still polls that at least hovered around kind of like 40, um, 50 percent for various accords there on both sides. Why did they fall through? Many, many reasons. If you want to look into Camp David and how much uh, fucking uh, contradictory statements there are on both sides, you can good luck with that. I'm not going into that. But one, it does look like one of the Israeli uh, demands was like, they still wanted control over West Bank airspace. Uh, they wanted to retain ownership of water. They wanted, they, like, they wanted a lot of things that were quite unreasonable, I think. Um, the pro-Israel side is very different. They think Arafat uh, rejected it because he wanted to launch violence instead to try, and get a better, to try and push for a better deal. He thought the violence would inspire like, a more generous deal, but I don't really know how strong the evidence is for that. So, yeah. I'm sorry. I just had that old server member get really fucking angry with me in my DMs because of that Hamas thing. Oh God. Me is Lewis. There's a lot of misbehavior in chat. What the fuck? But yeah, in case I gave the wrong impression, I feel like when I talk about Hamas not being that representative of Palestinian will, like there hasn't been an election in 2006, but that's because of uh, PA that suppressed those elections, not uh, Hamas. It's because their election wasn't recognized by the rest of the world and because in 2006, and because um, the elections aren't being held by Abbas, not by like Hamas kind of like at various points have wanted those elections because they would probably win. Um, but then again, like, if Barkuzi was out of jail, he would probably change that as well. So it's hard to say. It doesn't mean Hamas doesn't still rep like repress opposition, though. They do. Um, okay. Wow, well done, guys. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> 